Hello, everyone. So let, let me uh, briefly explain what uh, this is a session for uh, PhD training uh, at uh, the more advanced level about uh, rigid shapes and play uh, classifications under rigid motion isometry. So please uh, feel free to stop me and uh, ask uh, questions as always. So the results uh, today uh, were obtained uh, with uh, several members of our group in the Materials Innovation Factory at Liverpool. So most importantly, uh, PhD student Daniel Widerson, who is uh, finalizing his PhD uh, soon. So the key question, how uh, can we sense uh, rigid shapes? Uh, this question uh, actually has a prehistory um, can we hear the shape of a drum? So that question was uh, previously considered by uh, mathematicians, so actually dozens of years ago. So in, in, uh, in, in, a, similar, um, in, in a similar situation, when we uh, would like to understand uh, the shape of, uh, well, in that case, it was the shape of a drum, or more exactly the shape of, um, of, uh, of any object, through uh, measurements. So through, uh, in our case, it will be invariance. Through invariance, what I can compute it of the shape. So today, um, well, I use the different uh, word uh, sense. So to distinguish it from uh, the previous uh, weaker invariance, what were not um, sufficient to hear the shape of a drum. So that's what the motivation. Okay, <clears throat> we can see the different types of objects in our research, uh, mostly molecules and materials uh, at the atomic scale. So that's why, for example, when you look at a molecule, we uh, first look at uh, atoms or more exactly at centers of these atoms. So you can see the simply uh, them as zero size points. And uh, yes, of course, all atoms have uh, chemical elements naturally attached to them, and we could still use these um, chemical labels, um, chemical elements as labels of the points. Uh, but uh, we will start from the hard case when all points are not labeled. And uh, then uh, the question whether we have a same object or different <clears throat> becomes mathematically challenging because uh, even a molecule, so some simple object or a point cloud can be represented in many different ways. So that's why uh, when, um, when we talk about uh, objects, it's uh, important to clarify what, uh, what we mean by same objects or what we mean by different objects equivalently. And uh, here I usually... Um, refer to this paper with the question, same or different, that is the question simply in the title. So this question was asked for uh, more complicated objects, so-called uh, crystals, periodic crystals, or so solid crystalline materials, but the same, exactly the same question makes sense for uh, simpler finite objects. So, uh, yeah, so let me... <clears throat> Let me now uh, remind the definition of an equivalence. So we have discussed this concept previously in this PhD training. However, if, if you uh, still have any questions here, please ask. So an equivalence is a relation, and uh, a relation could be, could satisfy uh, these axioms of an equivalence, or it may not satisfy. If these axioms are satisfied, then we call this binary relation an equivalence. And these, uh, these axioms, reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity are really important, especially the transitivity, because uh, these axioms guarantee that our classification is well-defined. So it's not so-called fuzzy, it's a rigorous, well-defined classification. And there are many different types of equivalences that we could consider for uh, the same objects. So one simple example we learned from the primary school is equality, simply equality between numbers. So different, uh, the same number could be written down, as you see, in many different forms, but uh, it's natural to consider them uh, equivalent. But also on numbers, we could define uh, 
other equivalences. So any any simple examples you could suggest. Say two numbers uh, can be called equivalent. So your own equivalence relation if. So any suggestion for a simple equivalence between numbers. Like two numbers have the same domain. The same domain. Uh, remainder. The module a remainder. Yes. Modular. Two. Modular another number, for example, two. So it's uh, modular two remainders are often called parities. So you have a class of odd numbers, all equivalent to each other, and the class of even numbers, all equivalent to each other as well. Oh, this came in. <clears throat> right. Uh, or even simpler, we could say about two numbers are equivalent if we have the same sign. Say all positive numbers are equivalent to each other, all negative numbers are equivalent to each other, and while there is one more zero. So we're rather separate from these three classes. Okay. <clears throat> we, for uh, molecules, materials, uh, consider different, uh, much uh, stronger equivalents. Stronger means that we separate by this equivalence many more objects. So there will be many more classes of equivalences. So rigid motion. Rigid motion or rigid transformation in the Euclidean space Rn is uh, one of the definitions. So it's defined as a composition of any translation and any rotation, which I illustrated here in the plane. So you could translate the object and rotate it through any angle. So the result is rigid motion. Uh, a slightly different equivalence relation, which is also useful in practice, is isometry. So isometry is weaker because we also allow mirror reflections. For example, these two rigid objects were not uh, equivalent through translations or rotations, uh, but were equivalent uh, through this uh, vertical mirror reflection, the vertical line. When we add an extra um, an extra transformation to our equivalence lamp, we get a wider collection of equivalences, but a smaller collection of the resulting equivalence classes. So for example, these two uh, these two shapes now uh, under isometry are in the same class. The two different um, uh, classes of mirror images they merge they merge into one. So why is this rigid why is this rigid motion or isometry so important? So of course not real uh, not all real objects are uh, rigid. Yeah, you, you could easily imagine uh, some well, flexible objects in our life or in in our research we also study um, uh, wider for flexible molecules such as proteins. However, uh, even in this case, when our object is uh, somehow intrinsically flexible, it's important to distinguish different rigid uh, forms or conformations of this rigid object. Because uh, if a um, protein, for example, changes its uh, rigid shape, then it becomes actually a functionally different molecule. In what sense? So if, if it changes, for example, some pocket or cavity, then uh, the interaction with protein with another molecule, say a small drug molecule, changes. So the same, exactly the same drug molecule may not um, stick to uh, protein in a different shape. So that's why even for such flexible objects, it's important to distinguish, distinguish rigid information. Any questions so far? Okay, so I have uh, motivated uh, the equivalence, rigid motion to isometry. Now, uh, more specifically, what objects we consider. So the simplest mathematical representation uh, of a molecule is simply a collection of points. And here we have two different cases. When all points in our cloud of points are ordered, then this is a really easy case, well, in relative relative to the unordered case. Because 
when our points are ordered, so we can uh, index them by one, two, so et cetera, M, then this cloud is completely determined or more exactly it can be uh, uniquely reconstructed up to isometry from uh, a matrix of distances. So this matrix of distances, simply the Euclidean distances between points P, I, P, J, this matrix makes sense when only when our points are ordered because in the matrix, we need to know where, where to put our distance. So for points P, I, P, J, it will be usually in row I, column J. But if all our points are not ordered, then, uh, well, this matrix can be written down only after we choose some ordering, which, which, uh, which can be simply arbitrary if the points are really indistinguishable. So this distance matrix, um, uh, so I'm not discussing a, a proof, but uh, maybe in the simple case of, say, three points, you could easily imagine why three interpoint distances are enough. Because that uh, so-called SSS theorem hopefully is uh, known to you even from school geometry. So we have three points, so a triangle, basically on three points, so then three distances on these points are enough to rigidly determine the triangle or more exactly modular translations, rotations, and mirror reflections. So this uh, invariant based on distances is, uh, has also one more important property, which is called uh, Lipschitz continuity. So, so here I informally stated as um, well, perturbations up to a constant. So when we perturb any point up to um, Euclidean distance epsilon, which means that we shift a point in a small ball of radius epsilon around this point, then what happens with distances? So hopefully you can easily imagine if you have two points and each of these points is shifted by epsilon, then the distance between them changes up to, up to what number? Two points. One shifted by epsilon in, in any direction. In any direction, potentially in a high dimensional space. And another point is shifted by epsilon. Two epsilon. Two epsilon, right? So this formula follows from the so-called triangle inequality for a for Euclidean distance, but uh, this triangle axiom, as we previously discussed in, in our training, should hold for any distance metric. So that's why uh, in very, uh, well, these distances uh, are convenient for applications. So if you have any noise, the distance matrix changes only a little bit. So that's why we will, uh, when we discuss a more complicated case of um, not ordered points, unlabeled or unordered, then uh, we will similarly return or will require the slip shift continuity condition. Okay, so let me uh, highlight now the difference. So this, uh, so this statement about distances, uh, but it, they are completely enough to determine uh, a cloud of ordered points uh, modular isometry. This was known for nearly 100 years, or even well early in, in cases of triangles. But well, the main paper in the general case, in the Euclidean case, was published in uh, 1930s, so a long time ago. However, uh, when our points are not ordered, this simple solution cannot be easily extended to um, clouds of unordered points. Because uh, strictly speaking, uh, to write down a distance matrix, we need to index our points, so we need uh, to order them, and only after that a distance matrix makes sense. And the brute force uh, extension of this distance matrix to another point is to consider simply all m factorial permutations of points and then get a huge collection m factorial distance matrices. So theoretically, yeah, theoretically, say from a point of view of pure mathematics, it's possible. So it's finite invariant, so not infinite. So it's already finite, so it's already good, but not really practical, even for a small number of points. And we will see later, even for four points, what is what is four factorial? So how many permutations can we have on four points? Four factorial. 24, yeah, absolutely correct. So, it's, so imagine uh, for four points, it's a matrix four by four, but 24 such matrices. 
So, it, so, so, it will, so even by hand, you wouldn't consider, say, 24 matrices to, say, classify quadrilaterals in the plane. Yeah, this would not, not really practical. In, in, in molecules, you might argue there are uh, different chemical elements. So, uh, yes, so there are different elements, but uh, many molecules, even say water molecule, H2O, so it contains two indistinguishable hydrogen atoms. And other molecules, such as benzene, has uh, six carbon atoms and six hydrogen atoms. And uh, permutations, uh, well, naturally appear in these molecules as well. So six factorial by six factorial. So it's also a huge number for, for all the simple benzene molecule. So that's why we need, a, we need something different. So there is a problem. So now I, I state this problem more formally, in actually in a more pure mathematical form. So what we are looking for is uh, an invariant, which is a map from the space of isometric classes of clouds, say for fixed number of points, say M, in uh, Euclidean space of any dimension. So we'd like to map, uh, to have um, a value, uh, an invariant value for every cloud with, um, so with a value in some simple space. So in on the previous slide, our simple space was the space of matrices. We had, say, uh, m squared distances, or if you take only uh, half of this matrix, so also a quadratic number of distances. So it could be considered as a vector. In, but generally, it could be uh, not necessarily a vector. It could be yeah, a matrix. It could be uh, some, uh, some more complicated object. But that object should be simpler than the initial abstract space of isometry classes. Otherwise, yeah, it, would be, it wouldn't be interesting. So the first uh, and already very strong property uh, or requirement for this invariant is completeness. Sometimes it's also co called injectivity or um, an invariant might be called uh, separating. Uh, but I, I prefer the word completeness uh, and state it in the following form. So, Completeness means what any cloud, say, be uh, isometric, if and only if this invariant <coughs> takes the same value on these uh, isometric uh, clouds. So invariance means what if um, clouds are isometric, then the invariant take, takes the same value. But completeness is, is also in the opposite direction. If the invariant has the same value, then uh, our cloud should be isometric. So in a simple language, it's, it's an invariant which is the strongest possible under the given equivalence. So it's a sort of a DNA style code. Or in the language of computer science, it's uh, a descriptor with no false negatives and no false positives. So we, uh, our descriptor completely separates uh, given objects so without any potential confusion. Any questions? Um, say, uh, can you give a simple invariant, yeah, say, for a general cloud of M points? So any simple, not complete, but an invariant, say, a single number. An invariant uh, that is a single number. Invariant under, under isometry. Any examples? Any examples? Could give you yeah. anything simple. Say an example of an mm -hmm. which is equal. It remains the same if you uh, if you simply translate, rotate, or reflect point clouds. Number of points in the cloud. Number of points, yes. Yeah. It's a very simple integer invariant. Why not? Yes. Okay, non-integer. Real valid invariant. So also rather simple. So anything simple. So I think maybe there's like an identity operation. Or... Ah, well, I should say that um, an invariant could be uh, could be trivial. So in the sense that we map everything, say, to zero or to another constant. 
Yeah, formally, this is also an invariant, right? Because this constant value is preserved is the same for all our objects, but it doesn't distinguish anything, right? So it's not useful. So non-constant real valued invariant for a point cloud. So something more complicated than the number of points. Distance or angle invariance. Uh, so, uh, Roshan, could you repeat again the distance between what? A distance between the edges of the triangle, like in this example, length of the triangle after the rotation. Yeah, you, you are right, but we could can see the distances. So one challenge here that uh, we don't have labels for our points, so we don't know which point is first, second, third, and so on. So that's why we cannot simply say distance between points one and two, right? Because well, there are no, no these labels in, in, in the cloud. However, you are right, but in, yeah, we could can see the distances. So let's, um, for example, try the, simply the minimum interpoint distance. Minimum interpoint distance between points. So it, it it may appear between say points say one and two or three or four, right? So it could appear multiple times, but the minimum interpoint distance is the simple invariant, which is I hope obviously uh, preserved and the translations, adaptations, reflections, right? Anything else apart from a uh, minimum interpoint distance? The size size <clears throat> You consider like the size of the entire piece doesn't change depending on how you look at the number. Say the size, so more exactly, how, how do you define it? So, volume, not the volume, but the volume is too trivial. Well, your yeah, volume is actually quite non trivial because, first of all, we need to define an object with volume we compute, right? So it's complete, it, it's uh, non-trivial, but yeah, it could be done. Uh, we could consider so-called convex hull on our points and then take this volume, but something simple. <clears throat> so minimum interpoint distance, but you could also take the maximum interpoint distance. And that maximum in mathematics is often called the diameter. But the diameter actually of any set, not necessarily for a point cloud. So maximum or, well, you could guess Average distance, median distance, or any any other statistic you could compute from distances. Okay, so there are, there are many such invariants, but they are obviously, um, I hope, easy to see for you that they are complete only for two points. Right? If you have two points, one, well, the only invariant is the distance between and it is complete. Is, is it, is it uh, obvious to you? But if you can see the clouds of only two points, so nothing more, then the complete invariant and the uh, isometry or rigid motion uh, in actually in any Euclidean space, even in the line, is simply the distance between these points. Right? But even for three points, so one distance will, will not be complete, so the minimum distance. So should, uh -huh. it, should the variant always be one number? Not necessarily. So an invariant can take values in uh, basically in any space. But our aim is to have this space as simple as possible. Do we only define an invariant on average distances between points? Or is that, uh, are there multiple dimensions of what an invariant can? Can not, we take all of the simple distances? No, not necessarily. So as we discussed, you could take the volume of the convex hull. Right? So it, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not easy to uh, express that volume in terms of distances. Or you could take the surface, I mean, the surface area of that convex hull. So there could be many possible invariants. But they are different. Can we take the uh, invariant, for example, all possible pairwise distances as an invariant? Yes. Uh, so it depends now on, um, on so we should uh, probably define um, that space of invariants and the potential uh, equivalence on that space. So yes, later indeed, we will consider that um, collection of all pairwise distances, but we should consider them uh, unordered because our initial points are not ordered. So there's not one particular definition Yes, yeah, absolutely. So you could have n number of equations for single... For, for a single equivalence. Yeah, so let's actually summarize. So we could have many different, different equivalence relations 
on the same object, such as point clouds. So for example, we could consider even uh, point clouds up to translation only. Yeah, why not? Yeah, this is possible. But uh, we previously argued that uh, rigid motion is very natural in our world as, as the key equivalence relation. And isometry is only slightly different. So it's only slightly weaker. We uh, do not distinguish mirror images. But again, from a point of view of invariance, to go from to distinguish mirror images, we need only a sign of orientation. So it's only one extra bit of information. That's why actually in this talk, uh, I mostly consider um, isometry because it's a shorter word to write, but uh, we will prove theorems actually for the strong rigid motion. Uh, yeah, please. Previous lecture, but then we discovered the invariance of this pattern. Yeah, so invariant is basically a, an entity, a thing, uh, a classifier that is invariant, which means it does not change under a certain uh, certain condition, for example, on the original. But in programming language, for example, you can think about the if cycle or while cycle. In the while cycle, there's also a, a, an invariant, which is this condition the to repeat, yeah, to terminate, uh, which, which, which is an invariant of this cycle, which means that whilst it is invariant, the same, we are within the cycle. And as, as soon as we change this invariant, it's not invariant, it's not the same, we are, we are out of the cycle. So the same sort of thing it happens in here, and the idea is to use this not not only to separate the one single cycle, but to use it as a classification to to separate everything into mm bits. -hmm. Okay, and completeness is very important, but not a given because invariant indeed allows us to uh, to uh, to say that entities are not the same. Yeah, but uh, they, in general, do not allow us to uh, to say that they are the same. Yeah. Yes. For example, we could have, say, um, triangles, so three points, unordered for simplicity. Uh, different non-isometric triangles with the same interpoint distance, a minimum interpoint distance. Right? If you could easily imagine. So one inter minimum interpoint distance is fixed, but the third point could be anywhere far away from this two, right? Um, or a person's height, yeah? So mm -hmm. if height of a person is different, then we are dealing with different people. But the opposite is not always true to many. Yeah, so okay. in that case... Complete yeah. invariance suggests that we should be able to use that invariant as a unique distinction. Uh, yeah. Identify. Yeah. Uh, the condition that say this already doesn't change and it serves as a value for the yeah. yes so here you see uh invariance and completeness are logical implications in two different directions okay so invariance means that uh, if if two objects are equivalent then um, you have the same value completeness if you have the same value when the objects are equivalent okay <clears throat> So next condition, uh, Lipschitz continuity. So now I state it a little bit more formally. So Lipschitz continuity requires a, me a metric on our objects. Or more exactly, uh, we will consider metric on invariant values because well, our object point cloud is rather, well, isometry class of a point cloud is rather abstract. And we would like to compute, of course, our distance metric well, very specifically, numerically. So that's why it will be um, applied to invariant values. So in this invariant values, uh, distance metric is a function on pairs. So it's 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 a property. It's not a prop not a property of a single object. It's a distance between two objects. <clears throat> and this uh, distance should satisfy three axioms. So first, uh, distance equals zero if and only if our uh, invariants, our, our objects um, that uh, we are comparing are the same or well, now language equivalent or if I is a complete invariant, it means that our underlying clouds are isometric. 
So only for isometric clouds, the distance should be zero, only in this case. And uh, if this axiom, so first metric axiom is satisfied, then um, this axiom guarantees us a solution to the um, isometry detection problem. Because if you'd like to understand whether two, um, whether two point clouds are isometric, then we simply compute the distance between the invariant values, complete invariant values, and check whether it is zero or not. If zero, yes, they are isometric. If not zero, no, they are not isometric. Okay? But this distance gives more information. So isometry detection problem or classification problem that it gives only a binary answer. Whether two given objects are equivalent or not. So if point clouds are isometric or not, only binary answer. But distance uh, gives more information um, in, in principle. So it could quantify how, how different our objects are. So two more, uh, two more uh, relations, two more axioms, uh, symmetry. So rather with and the triangle inequality, which you might remember from school geometry again. So for any uh, three points in the plane, the sum of, this, of any two um, sides in the triangle should be uh, larger or equal to the third side. Okay. So any uh, distance function satisfying these three axioms is called a metric or distance metric. And uh, especially the triangle axiom here is important because there is a, a recent paper, I, I didn't include the reference, but could briefly describe the result. So it says that if you consider a similarity, sort of a similarity distance, which is not a metric in the sense that it fails the triangle axiom, even with very small positive error. So imagine this sum is uh, slightly less than D3, even up to a small epsilon. So in that case, it's, po uh, it's possible to find examples, so examples of such uh, similarities, um, distances, not metrics, when uh, popular clustering algorithms such as k-means and dbscan output simply uh, arbitrary results, simply predetermined results. It, it means that uh, clustering is not trustworthy or when we use uh, non-metrics. So that's why metrics are important. And now Lipschitz continuity. So if you have our metric, then uh, there should be a constant lambda so very specific numerical constant, and this constant will be simply two in our further results, such that uh, after perturbing every point of our cloud up to epsilon, the invariant changes up to uh, at most uh, lambda epsilon in, the, in this metric that we have chosen. So the invariant changes only a little bit up to um, uh, lambda times epsilon. So why, why, is it, why is this continuity important? Because uh, if, uh, imagine we have solved the um, isometry detection problem. So imagine we can answer the question well, the two point clouds are isometric or not. So this question is actually simpler than the problem we are stating here because well, how could, you, how could you try solving this isometry detection problem? Well, you could choose, say, one point in the first cloud and, say, an arbitrary point, which you also call the first in the second cloud. And then, say, translate, so match these points, and then try to find a rotation that matches all clouds. So these algorithms were uh, known for a while, so about 20, 35 years ago, um, already, yeah, and the best algorithm is known for 20 years. So good algorithms what solve that problem. Uh, when our output is binary, so yes or no. If you have this output, then we can actually define a very simple uh, distance uh, on isometric classes as follows. If our clouds are isometric, then the distance by this action should be equal to zero, right? It's easy. If uh, point clouds are not isometric, if they're different, then the distance should not be zero. And let's choose any value, for example, one. 
So our distance line takes two values, zero and one. This distance, so it's called a discrete metric. So it can be defined for actually uh, any classes of equivalences, not only for point clouds. This uh, discrete metric is not continuous in that sense. Why? Because we could start from isometric clouds, but then perturb a little bit only one point. And then uh, the new clouds become non-isometric. But our distance uh, changes discontinuously. So it was zero for isometric clouds, but after small perturbation, it becomes one. So one here, of course, is not, it's not really important. You could choose any non-zero number, but the discontinuity will remain. Right? Uh, so one more. Uh, so is, is it clear? So any questions? Why uh, Lipschitz continuity is a non-trivial property? This Lipschitz continuity, let me briefly mention, uh, is uh, much stronger than uh, so-called classical epsilon delta continuity. I don't give uh, this formal definition in terms of epsilon delta, but <clears throat> let me compare. For example, a function one over x, say if you consider it for positive x, so you could hopefully uh, imagine by this hyperbola graph one over x. So this function is continuous for all positive x, right? <laughs> but it's not Lipschitz continuous uh, for any domain um, close to zero. Because while well, the rate of change well, goes to infinity at zero. So what does it mean? It means that in a sense, almost any function is continuous, well, apart from well, obvious examples when our function is say not defined, <laughs> or we deliberately make it discontinuous. But well, all, all functions can be in principle considered continuous uh, away from singularities. However, this continuity is very weak. Um, the Lipschitz continuity is much stronger, so this um, constant lambda means what our function, roughly speaking, if, if it's also differentiable, simplicity, cannot, uh, in, can, uh, has a gradient at most lambda, so it cannot increase to plus. Okay? And uh, one, more, um, one more comment about lambda. A specific uh, value of lambda is not important. Why? Why not important? Because if, say, it is large, if it is, say, 1 million, you could say, well, Lipschitz constant 1 million, this is not practical, it's too large. Well, I could make, I could make it, much, uh, it much smaller by the following trick. So let's take our distance, distance metric, and divide it by 1 million. I mean, instead of, instead of original values, let's simply divide it by 1 million. But all axioms, remain. So all, all axioms still hold because we simply uniformly scale our metric. But the Lipschitz constant will be divided by one million. Right? So that's why uh, Lipschitz continuity is important, but a specific value is not really important. So we, we can adjust our metric to make it small. Maybe, maybe just sure. maybe try to check my understanding of yeah. what's on this slide because that slide seems to contain quite a lot of so we have the invariant is here, which is can be seen slowly simple classification tool, and essentially quite a weak one, unless we start adding some more properties to that. And the first property that we would like to have is completeness, which means it should work, classification should work nicely in both directions. Yeah? But then we are adding another one, which is continuity, which is basically very, very restricted changes controllably restricted changes under small perturbations or deviations, which is not a given in many cases, which we traditionally think as being continuous. One of the X is a good example of that, yeah, because it is indeed continuous, but around zero it's not, whereas here we want it to be. Why do we need it? Because we would like, uh, well, uh, we would like to be able to compare the classes that we get, not as a binary comparison, yes or no, mm -hmm. but in some other more interesting way. way mm -hmm. Yeah. And for that, we also need to define a metric with that, because the binary classification or binary yes no uh, it means not a very interesting metric. 
Yeah, discrete or discontinuous. Yeah, well, here it will be the choice of both invariant and also probably the metric itself. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, whilst the existence of the constant is the existence of this restriction, but the constant itself is not very interesting because then we can scale the measurement to which is the metric. Is it as a point? Yes. Um, yeah. okay. well, thank you, Olga, for your summary. Uh, <clears throat> But we haven't finished with conditions because uh, if you only stop on the previous slide, then there will be a rather simple solution. So, in, well, mathematically, we could define the invariant as the collection of all isometric images of our point cloud. Infinite collection. Yeah, yeah formally it's complete, but not health. So, we, of course, we should avoid flat infinite cases, but also previously we have seen we could consider a finite invariant. For point clouds and factorial distance matrices, right? Yeah, it's finite, so it's better than infinite, but also not practical. Or uh, in um, actually in this uh, area of um, uh, atomistic simulations, people often consider so-called decompositions um, in the basis of spherical harmonics, uh, but this decomposition is formally in the infinite basis. So what, what invariant what we get from this decomposition is an infinite sequence. However, our original object, the point cloud, is fine. So that's why it's uh, very natural to ask about a finite invariant that uh, can be complete and continuous. So let me state now uh, two harder conditions um, which, um, which will make everything more practical. So computability. So in the language of computer science, we require that the invariant and the metric on invariant values should be computable in polynomial time of the number of points, say for a fixed ambient dimension. So there is a well-known so-called curse of dimensionality in computer science. So when our when our algorithmic complexity depends exponentially on the dimension. So we are not promising here to resolve this curse of dimensionality, but if you fix a dimension, and in practical applications, our dimensions will be two or three, so it's a natural assumption. Then for this fixed dimension, the algorithmic complexity should be polynomial in the number of points. So this is a reasonable requirement. Uh, but also, uh, the final condition, which is here stated uh, rather informally, but uh, mathematically, it means that we would like um, not only complete, continuous, and computable invariant, but also simple enough invariant. So what does it mean simple? Simple means that we can describe uh, the space of realizable values of these invariants. For example, um, yeah, I'll show this example in details on the next uh, page, but uh, imagine we use uh, interpoint distances, right? Uh, well, what, what uh, values of distances are realizable? So we cannot take value zero or even negative, right? So these values are obviously forbidden, so only positive values. But even if you have positive values on the result of triangle inequality, that we should satisfy for any three points. So you see, it becomes non-trivial in principle. <clears throat> so uh, with condition on realizability means that we we somehow explicitly describe all realizable values, and for any realizable value, we can reconstruct an original cloud, also in polynomial time. So everything here should be efficient. Any questions on, on these conditions on the problem? So, so far, I have stated the problem. So it's already more than a half of the session. But now uh, let's uh, discuss what, what has been done um, uh, recently and not so recently. So hopefully from school, you know one simple solution to this problem for three points. So this solution actually works not only in the plane, but in any Euclidean space. So SSS theorem, side, 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 um, says the following, two triangles are congruent, or in our language, isometric, if and only if they have the same triple of sides, ABC, which should be considered up to all permutations if you include mirror reflections. But if you exclude mirror reflections, if on the rigid motion, then uh, we should allow only three cyclic permutations. Okay? But for simplicity, if you consider isometry, then when the problem is fully solved, 
because we can also visualize large space of realizable invariants. So what is our space? So we could simply write down with triple sides in order. So according uh, to the lens. So A should be positive, not greater than B, not greater than C. And uh, one more inequality. So one more triangle inequality saying that C is not greater than A plus B. So if you take any triple of real numbers satisfying these inequalities, you will get a rigid, uh, yeah, a rigid triangle moduli isometry, unique. And you could even visualize it. So you have uh, three, three parameters, so three invariants, A, B, C, um, satisfying these inequalities. These inequalities, they define a triangular cone in our space. And here I show this cone by that yellow section. By this yellow section, uh, when, well, you could, for example, scale all triangles, if you, if you add a uniform scaling to our equivalence, then you get actually exactly this yellow triangle as a space, as the space of shapes. So in this triangle, well, uh, there, are, well there is a vertex corresponding to equilateral triangles, when A equals to B equals to C. Right? So all equilateral triangles are on this diagonal. So that diagonal line in the three-dimensional space. Right? So for any point on the diagonal, you have an equilateral triangle. Then uh, on these two boundary sides, you have uh, two types of isosceles triangles. So one more vertical, another one more horizontal, and they, yes, they meet at, at the equilateral triangle as expected. And the third side here dashed, um, is <clears throat> for degenerate triangles, when three points are on the same straight line, but in terms of point clouds, we can still consider that case. So you see, so this solution was known for more than 2,000 years, essentially. I'm pretty sure Euclid knew about this theorem, right? So the, the problem was solved for three points. But how about four points? So imagine, uh, we now would like to solve the same problem. So we'd like to have a map like that for four points. Anything you remember from school about four points? Okay. So is the problem open for four points? I mean, an invariant satisfying all these conditions. Completeness. Continuity, computability, so most importantly, <clears throat> and that geographic style map showing the space of the trilaterals. So, uh, in computer science, uh, there is a um, growing area of geometric deep learning, which tries to solve essentially problem like that, so exactly like that for point clouds, or for similar objects such as graphs, of other types of objects, but essentially under the same conditions, experimentally. So they are, for example, outputting uh, isometry invariants uh, from neural networks, but uh, without proofs of completeness and continuity. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Yeah, so actually I was asking, I was going to ask the question which you probably answer later. So we all sort of learn that three points is enough. Yeah, if ah. we know triangular geometry, then it's enough to define any other well, be tri triangulate everything, and uh, four points obviously can be triangulated. Yeah, and that's it. And then we just apply everything for three points. Um, well, uh, not, not really, because for four points, uh, for four points, yeah, if you imagine, say, four points for simplicity on three dimensional space, play right, and in general position, define a tetrahedron, right? So a tetrahedron has four triangles. Right. Uh, in the plane, for four points, we could consider two triangulations, two diagonals can split it. Or if you have more points, then where, well, there is a choice of triangulation. So you could triangulate in many different ways. So there is no unique, well defined triangulation, even in the plane. And <clears throat> even if you triangulate, we actually put some sort of order in our points. Because so some points now become triples. So it's not exactly an order one, two, etc. M, but nonetheless, it's an extra structure. So it's an extra restriction on our original un unstructured point cloud. But doesn't that just increase the number of permutations that you have to go through? 
if you have multiple meetings, if you there's mm -hmm. not one particular time that you can make, you need multiple times, you just at the end it increases the number of combinations, which are anyways in the piece. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. So we could in principle construct invariants based on triangles. So consider, for example, all triples. Uh, all triples of points, and then taking, say, sides or areas of these triangles, but you're right. Well, there are even more triples or a cubic number of triples of points than uh, interpoint distances. Yeah, yeah, please, please check if, if anyone would like to come. Yeah, yeah because theoretically, yes, it is possible. Uh, theoretically, it is possible, but it's the same logic which allows us to trace the exact uh, coordinates of every object in the world and their changes by representing everything in zeros and ones. Yeah? Theoretically, it is possible, if, but when we deviate over slightly zeros and ones change. And theoretically, again, it is possible to calculate every single change of zeros and ones. But practically, it requires so many computations quickly. But I think we are already doing a lot of computations with the number of sites that we have, even the time. So we still have problems. Yeah, so we can do better than that. Uh, so let's first try a naive extension of the SSS theorem to quadrilaterals. So we could consider all, so how many actually interpoint distances do you have? In a four points, yeah. Just four points, yeah. So it's one point to all the three other points, and that's a four points, which is squares. Uh, 24? Well, why 25? Well, just one point will have with each of the other three points. And that's for all of the all of the points. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, but some of them are it's not directed, isn't it? Oh yeah. Okay. Just, so similarly to triangles, right? So you're not yeah. taking three times two. You can uh, three times two over two because we can see the another pairs. So for four points, how many another at pairs do you have? Another at pairs of four points. Six, six Henry, yes, absolutely correct. Six points, uh, sorry, six distances. So this is an example, say uh, tra trapezium, four points, six distances, you, you see them here. So do you think it is a strong invariant? Uh, the collection of all interpoint distances. Six, six numbers, right? So it's uh, it's quite a lot. What do you mean by strong? Yes, a good question. So this invariant is indeed strong in the exact following sense. Uh, this vector of pairwise distances, we could, we could uh, write them similarly in order, simply by increasing length. So we are not keeping, of course, order of points, so we don't know which, so they say one specific distance, which points um, connects. But the values, six values, can be written down um, in the increasing order. So you have a well-defined vector. So this, this vector is generically complete. Generically means that any point clouds in general position so apart from single configurations, are distinguished by this invariant. So up to a small perturbation, you get a generic point cloud, and it is uniquely determined by six interpoint distances. Uh, actually, this is true for any number of points and in any Euclidean dimension. So this is a very strong pairing, but unfortunately, this invariant is not complete. So it's almost complete, but there are counterexamples. So this is the simplest, probably the simplest count example. So two different quadrilaterals or clouds of four points with exactly the same six interpoint distances. Is it, is it convincing enough, this example? Mm -hmm. So coordinates here are actually integer numbers. So you could put the origin, for example, here in the middle, and then uh, this point uh, has coordinates to zero, and that point has coordinates one, one. 
minus one lan and this is minus two zero. And similarly here. So points have integer coordinates, very simple example, not distinguished by six and point distances. So that uh, simple extension of the SSS theorem even to four points fails. That's why we need strong invariants. So even stronger than that. The previous example was not unique. And I learned it actually less than, uh, so about a year ago only approximately. I was very surprised myself. But uh, that example is, um, can be extended to a huge family, continuous family of counter examples. So here you see uh, two point clouds. So C plus and C minus. And they illustrated on this common picture. So these uh, clouds of four points, they share the same three points. So the green points are common. In one point cloud, we take in addition to green points, the orange point, and that's our C plus cloud. And in another cloud, C minus, we take uh, this blue point in addition to the green points. So we have one cloud, another cloud, and these point clouds depend on four free parameters. So these values A, B, C, D, hello? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we, we are starting early now. It's 11 o'clock. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So don't worry. Don't worry. Just join. Yes. Because we are at like actually most interesting moment in the, in the whole presentation. So here you see uh, um, an infinite family uh, of pairs of quadrilaterals, so or more exactly clouds of four points that have exactly the same six interpoint distances between them. Six interpoint distances, exactly the same. Uh, so hopefully it's actually easy to, easy, to, um, easy to see because three green points are common. So between them, of course, distances are the same. But also what happens with, uh, when we replace the orange point by the blue point? So we have three distances from this orange point to three others, right? Say from orange point to P3. But then this distance D1, so it's repeated here it's from the blue point to P2. Do you see? Simply because these uh, points P2, P3, were centrally symmetric with respect to the origin. So that's why here we have a, a parallelogram. So that's why. Changing one point, we keep six center point distances. And it's an infinite family. So the invariant uh, well fails well miserably. So it's all it's almost complete, but uh, how how incomplete it is. So for, for four points, say in the plane, for simplicity, four points in the plane, we have six center point distances, right? Uh, do you think we can choose with six center point distances arbitrarily? Or not? Say positive numbers, of course, and for simplicity, yes. Reasonable, say, and all triangle inequalities are satisfied. Is it enough or not? Six center point distance. For example, I give you numbers, say, six numbers equal to one, right? Triangle inequalities are satisfied. Is there a quadrilateral with six interposed distances equal to one? Hmm? Can you draw it on the plane? Degenerate for any. You know, yeah. in the plane, four points in the plane with six interpoint distances equal to one. Is it possible or not? No, no, no. So, yeah, but of course, we should be positive, right? Yeah. We should be positive, but I give you one example. Six values equal to one. So satisfying positivity and also all triangle inequalities, naturally, because one plus one greater than one, right? Is like quadrilateral with that distances. Okay, say three points. Three points, all distances equal to one. Can you, can you visualize it? Can you see it? Yeah, so it's an equilateral triangle, all distances equal to one. Now we are trying to add one more point, fourth point with distances also equal to one to this three. 
Is it possible in the plane? So if you have six, I mean, yes. it wouldn't be possible for the diagonal distances. I mean, you can have a square, but the distance yeah. of the other two points. Yeah, the oh, other. I'd say yes, but only if it coincides with some other points. Okay, or we should push this point in dimension three. Right? So in the plane, not possible. In dimension three, it will be an equilateral tetrahedron. Right? If all distance is equal to one, it's an equilateral tetrahedron, but it exists only in the three dimensional space. We cannot uh, push it to the plane. Right? But you can reconstruct it with the endpoint in size. Yeah. Um, so in this case, of course, the order of points doesn't matter because all of values, all interpoint distance is equal to one. Right? So you write down the distance matrix and reconstruct it, but the reconstruction will give us a, an equilateral tetrahedron in the three-dimensional space, right? So not in the plane. So what's the problem here? The problem is that for any uh, four points, even in the plane, we could consider the tetrahedron on these four points. But if our points are in the plane, the tetrahedron is degenerate. Degenerate means that the volume of this tetrahedron is zero, right? But uh, for any points in the three-dimensional space, the volume of the tetrahedron of these points can be expressed in terms of six interpoint distances. So there is a formula for that. It's a bit somewhat complicated, but it is possible. So it's similar to Heron's formula for a triangle, but in a three-dimensional space. So it's a complicated formula. So it's a polynomial, basically, uh, in terms of the six interpoint distances equal to zero. So it's a non-trivial restriction on six distances. Polynomial equation that should be satisfied by our six distances. So why is it important? So we have six distances, but one polynomial restriction on them, which means that, roughly speaking, the dimension of our space is six minus one, five. So the space of quadrilaterals in the plane is five dimension. And right, so there are five free parameters basically. Right? For example, if you fix five interpoint distances, one the six can uh, can take only discrete values, so solutions of this polynomial complicated polynomial equation. Okay, so <clears throat> five dimensional space, but in this five dimensional space, there is subspace depending on four free parameters. So it's called dimension one. So you go from a general position one dimension lower and you get complete fail. So the invariant does, doesn't distinguish uh, point clouds on the one dimension down in our space. So it's, yeah, it doesn't contradict the previous theorem, it's correct. But if, if we have a huge family of uh, single account examples, as shown. <clears throat> so that's why we need strong invariants. Now, this first strong invariant, uh, we called it pointwise distance distribution. So it was actually considered previously, even in a more general context, and uh, was called local distribution of distances. So more than even 10 years ago, but we proved specific variants uh, for this invariant in the more complicated periodic case, not discussed today, and also extended it to uh, actually a complete invariant. So let me, let me explain how to construct it. So for the same examples, uh, take one vertex, uh, say top left vertex of the uh, trapezium, and now we write down distances per point, so in a pointwise way. So distances to neighbors in increasing order. Root 2 is the smallest distance, the next is 2, and then root 10. So these three distances are written in the first row. Okay? Now take the next point, say top right vertex. Well, due to symmetry here, uh, the distances to neighbors are exactly the same in order, right? So that's why we should have two equal rows, but it's convenient to collapse with identical rows into a single one and assign the weight. So here, the number one half or 50% means that two of four points, so two of four vertices of our trapezium, we have exactly the same distances to neighbors. Okay, so these two top uh, vertices have this distance list, 
and with bottom vertices have a different distance list. Okay, so also equal. So point with this distribution is the matrix, uh, formally M by K, where the first, uh, um, so K here is the number of, is the number of neighbors we consider. So we could in principle make it smaller. So consider only first neighbors. But in general, we could go up to M minus one neighbors, so taking all of them. And the first column is a bit separate. Uh, so these are weights of points. Now, the great example has a different PDD matrix, as you can see. So there is also some symmetry. So there is a collapse uh, for rows um, written down for these two symmetric points, right? But the matrix has three different rows now. So the invariant obviously became stronger because we, uh, roughly speaking, we have split our distances per point. So previously, they were all together in one distribution. Now we have split one per point. Questions? Okay, so what is more important, uh, of course, we could get the previous invariant simply by collecting uh, all these distances together, taking weights into account, of course, and um, uh, roughly uh, dividing by two, because every distance here appears twice. Uh, in a row for one endpoint, in a, in a row for another endpoint, if you expand the matrix to well, the full number of points. So what is important, uh, we can compare these matrices continuously. Because remember, our aim is to compare invariance in a continuous way. And we can do it actually in many different ways. Because we can interpret these matrices as probability distributions. So we can we look at these weights as probabilities. So probability one half for this vector, or if you wish for a point in the three-dimensional space, and probability one half for another point in the three-dimensional space. Mm -hmm. So we have essentially mapped our trapezium to uh, a couple of points in the three-dimensional space, but with weights, with probabilities. And this guide maps to three points of the different probabilities. Now, we can compare probability distributions by using many metrics. And here, I, uh, in our experiments, we consider the simplest, probably the simplest possible metric on this distribution is called Earth Movers Distance. So uh, let me uh, illustrate this <coughs> Earth Movers Distance on this, ex on this example, which is actually um, prepared for the more complicated periodic case, but uh, I hope you could easily imagine the final case. So- Can I just maybe sure. uh, uh, add the importance of this distance because it's suitable that if there isn't any uh, probability distributions, that's how and why it was developed. And that's how it's used in many other places in computer science on the ground, yeah? Just to compare any two shapes or distribution shapes. Because you have one distribution, for example, for you know, some kind of quantifiable situation, something like that, yeah? You could another one, but you need to compare them now, somehow. So that's a very strong tool and very useful and usual tool. Yes, initially it was defined also many years ago in 1930s uh, by um, Kantarovich in, um, to solve a problem basically in transportation failure how to transport resources, say, from mines to factories. So we have a certain number of mines, a certain number of factories in different locations, and it's important to transport these resources in the most optimal way. So that's what Earth Movers Distance essentially does. So basically, we split uh, rows um, in the first matrix into paths, and then, come and then move or transform these paths into uh, optimally split rows in the second matrix. So in that simple example, so this is a, a, a subset of the unit square lattice here. And PDD invariant is defined similarly for the square lattice when we write down distances to neighbors in increasing order. So our four uh, distances in the square lattice will be one, 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 right? And the small perturbation the lattice actually changes substantially because it's small unit cell now becomes four times larger. 
But what is important here is that distances changed only a little bit. And yeah, we demonstrated in terms of the, of the F numbers distance. So when we push this point a little bit up, actually by 0 0.1 exactly in that example, and this point down by 0 0.1, then the distances, so these blue edges, they have the following values, following lengths. Yes, they are not equal to one anymore, but they are still close to one. Yeah, because our perturbation was small. And for red uh, distances, well, the values are even closer to one. So how to compare these two matrices? So f numbers distance, well, well, optimally, what can we do? We, we obviously split with single row into two halves, and then compare these two halves with the uh, two rows in the second matrix. So uh, we can compare, in principle, the rows in by using many different metrics. We use the so-called um, L infinity distance, which is the maximum absolute difference between corresponding coordinates. So in this case, the comparison of these rows gives 0 0.2. So we maximum deviate from initial distances by 0 0.2. And uh, by even by a smaller number between by this black row and red row. And f more distance simply takes low weighted average of these deviations. That's it. So formula of Ferrum says uh, that if you perturb points up to epsilon, then the f more distance of the uh, PDD of the initial set, PDD of the perturbation is at most two epsilon. And you remember the idea, right? So when we have only two points, we shift each of these points by up to epsilon, the distance changes up to two epsilon, and this theorem essentially generalizes that simple fact to uh, much more complicated invariants, PDD, points with distance distributions. Any questions on that invariant? So listen, yeah. Yeah, maybe you know, try to understand uh, in a practical, uh, clinical terms, comparing to what you said um, of the problem of practical comparisons of resources that are needed in for transportation. Yeah. Uh, so. Maybe here it's a good, a good example of, of why it's important because it allows us to do some kind of sensitivity analysis for the resources that will be needed if we change one of the files in the society, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So it's a very practical uh, question that we really need to, to ensure the stability of our system. Okay, now is it a complete invariant PDD? So it's a strong invariant, a previous invariant, but I should say it distinguished all these examples. At the moment, it is a conjecture in the plane. Do you think it is complete? We actually formally proved it for four points, but not for uh, more than four points. So if, if you have any ideas, you're welcome actually to contribute. Proof that PDD is a complete invariant for a point clouds in the plane. But we know that it is not complete in the three-dimensional space. So three-dimensional space is larger. There are well, basically more opportunities to arrange points to get equal distances. And it is not complete. That's why we went further, so worked harder and produced a strong invariant. Yeah, more complicated, but probably complete. So let me first, uh, let me first, um, so this, this diagram illustrates so what happens. So we sorted distance vector, so all pairwise distances sorted in order. That's simple, generic, generically complete, known for, uh, for 20 years, since 2004. Then, uh, so see, we here <clears throat> extended in two directions. So far, we talked only about Euclidean space, right? Uh, but when we talk about distances, we could consider a more general so-called metric space, when we have no Euclidean structure, but only distances between points. And the same problem, so isometric classification of point clouds makes sense in that more general setting of a metric space, not necessarily Euclidean. So that's why we defined uh, some invariants in these uh, more general metric spaces, and then uh, adapted with invariants to um, simpler, faster 
uh, version which is provably complete in the Euclidean space. So this Ethereum from our paper we've done. And let me, uh, let me now uh, explain the key idea of the invariant in the last 10 minutes only. <clears throat> So, what was the idea of point with distance distribution? We were writing down distances per point. Right? <clears throat> now, let's write down distances not per point, but per a pair of points. And then per triple of points and so on. So, that's the uh, idea. So, we, we go simply uh, to higher order invariance here. So, we fix uh, a subset A, which should be uh, an ordered sequence of points. So previously it was a single point, but now let's fix two points, say P2, P3, and this triangle example. For a fixed subset P, P2, P3, we can write down, first of all, the distance between them, well, which is A, right? But also we can write down distances from any other point to these fixed points. So in this case, it will be C and P. It will be, so in that case, it's one column, but generally it's a matrix. Two rows and uh, M minus two columns. Okay, so we call it a relative distance distribution. Is relative distance distribution an isometry invariant? Question for you. Is it, is it invariant? So formally, you see it's a pair, a distance between two fixed points and um, a column of distances to these two fixed points, a matrix of distances. <clears throat> is, it, is it invariant? Which means, does it, is it the same? Is it the same it for shift? if you shift, but uh, translate, rotate, shift. but also more importantly, what happens if we permute our points? Is it invariant under relabeling or permutation? From the name, it seems like it should be. No, no. Well, there is no, well, see, there is no word invariant here. <laughs> it's relative it's distance like distribution. It's, yeah. So the word relative, so it's relative to a subset, to a pair of points. And if you choose a different pair, a different pair, for example, P3, P1, below then our distribution will be different so it will be it will simply include different values in different positions okay and yeah one more trip if you simply swap uh, these two points so that's easy because well uh, these points uh, in that matrix so these rows in the matrix are swapped but generally we should consider them all pairs all pairs of points. Only after that we get an invariant. So similarly with the point with distance distribution, we should consider all points together. So after defining this RDD, we, uh, <clears throat> we need to take all these RDDs for all subsets. It's enough to take only another subset if we consider also RDD up to, up to permutations of rows. Okay, so for second order, when we fix a pair of points, we get, I hope you see, a strong invariant, as we call it SDD, simplex wise distance distribution of order two. And this SDD distinguished all counterexamples to the completeness of easy invariants in the three dimensional space. So this is the exact uh, theorem that we proved about SDD in a metric space. So not Euclidean space, any general metric space. What we proved, it's computable in polynomial time for fixed age, for, for fixed order. And has Lipschitz constant too. It's continuous under perturbations. With respect to this earth movers distance, and uh, which is also computable in polynomial time. Now let me show you uh, this complicated example in three-dimensional space. Well, this example is very known for actually for a while, for about 10 years, but they are quite interesting. So it's six points only. So not a large example at all. 
they um, these two sets, these two um, so t plus and t minus two clouds, they differ only by a single point. They differ by this orange point. So in the, on the left, the orange point has z coordinate minus one, and on the right, the uh, orange point has uh, z coordinate plus one. So here you see the xy projection. Okay, so <laughs> simple difference, but these uh, clouds of six points, we have not, a, not only the same pairwise distances, but also the same PDD invariants. But we have distinguished them by SDD. And I should say, but uh, here you see one example, but uh, actually it's an infinite family of examples. So they de depend on three, three, three parameters. So roughly speaking, these distances L1, L2, L3, what is shown, they could be uh, changed arbitrarily. So you could deform this example and get a continuous family of pairs. And all this family has the same PDD matrix. So I mean, really solve the Second? PDD? No, RDD. Uh, RDD is not an invariant, SDD. SDD is a collection of all RDDs taken together. So SDD distinguishes all of them. All these infinitely many examples. So we proved it theoretically. So we couldn't do it, of course, ex experimentally. Well, I mean, rigorous proof, because we have infinitely many parameters. But we proved it theoretically, but SDD distinguishes all of them. Which oh yeah, wasn't easy at all, but we managed. We managed uh, to show that uh, no counterexamples for that environment. But it's still, still, of course, not a proof that it's, well, it's complete. So we don't know whether it is complete or not. We only managed to distinguish uh, all these examples for that environment. But we proved, uh, we, uh, we defined uh, a stro an even stronger invariant for the Euclidean space. For the Euclidean space, we have one extra help. Because in the Euclidean space, we can take uh, sums of factors. For example, we could take the center of mass of a point cloud. And when we have the center of mass, it could be fixed or translated to low origin. So when comparing point clouds, it's very natural to translate center of mass to low origin. And then we have ambiguity only after rotations. So the problem is still non-trivial. We have infinitely many rotations, but we have basically removed one degree of freedom. So we use we use the center of mass to define simplex wise center distribution. So it's, the definition is uh, almost exactly the same as in the previous case, but in our other subset, we take the center of mass as one selected point. So it's not arbitrary, it's one selected point. Okay, so, so the zero is included. So in the plane, what does it mean? In the plane, center of mass is at low origin, and we need only one more point to fix. If you have two fixed points, then the position of any other point is defined, is uniquely determined by two distances and a sign. So we need to know whether to put this point above or below that line for the center of mass and one more fixed point. So that's why the invariant becomes simple. We have uh, a choice of only one extra point instead of two. So let me, so let me, uh, well, here I show an example how to actually compute it in a simpler case, but uh, probably I should finish with, um, yeah, also let me skip this Lipschitz continuity and finish with the main result. So the main result is what invariant simplex y centered distribution is complete for unordered points and uh, rigid motion in any Euclidean space. So not only after isometry, so we distinguish up to mirror reflections as well. So due to, due to what extra science what I mentioned. So computable in this polynomial time, for example, in the plane, it's only quadratic time. Lipschitz constant two, in the f minus distances before, and that distance is also computable in this polynomial time. If we are inter if we do not distinguish uh, mirror images, then we need to take a pair of invariants. 
an invariant full cloud, and an invariant basically for its mirror image. And that pair becomes complete on the isometry. So I think my time is actually uh, exactly over. So I, I should I should finish at uh, this uh, at this slide, but uh, let me actually quickly go to um, to the final slide to advertise the next talk. So today we talked about finite point clouds, and next time I will talk about periodic point cells. Basically, the problem is very similar. It's much harder. The periodic case is harder. It's infinite, but uh, we will we will prove. Well, we'll describe this, explain what PDD, the same PDD invariant, is genetically complete for periodic crystals. So this is the second uh, hard problem in this new area of geometric data science. But let me highlight that the problem that we stated makes sense not only for point clouds, not only for discrete sets. We could replace uh, this object by, for example, graphs or simplicial complexes, surfaces, so any types of object. And similarly, uh, isometry can be replaced by another equivalence relation. So you simply replace objects and equivalences, but state the problem to find complete, continuous, and computable invariants for these new types of objects. So, so that's why geometric data science is growing. Okay, let me finish the recording.